This video is sponsored by AudioMika, manufacturers of the interconnects and speaker cables used by a British audiophile. For more information about these and their other products, please click the link in the description. My plan for the early part of 2024 was to review a bunch of products at circa five to 10 grand. The Kerr Acoustic K300 Mark III speakers that you see behind me are the final product in that lineup. I will naturally revisit this price point again in the future, but after these speakers, I plan to focus on some different price ranges. It made a lot of sense to have a bunch of these products in at the same time, that way I could do comparative reviews between them. So let me give you a brief synopsis as to how I got on. I started 2024 by reviewing the CSS Typhon speakers that retail directly for 5,500 US dollars, plus shipping and taxes. They may not be the last word in resolution for their price, but it would be simplistic to say that they lack detail. The Typhons soften the leading edges of notes in the mid-range. They also roll off the lower treble. It gives a fluid, easygoing kind of presentation, but the bass delivery and instrument separation is exceptional. They'll also play louder and fill larger spaces than any of the other speakers that I'm covering in this roundup. The special edition of Thomas's Galleon TS120 amplifier that I reviewed in February is also sold direct. For $4,495 US dollars plus shipping and taxes, you get battleship build quality. The damn thing weighs over 30 kilograms or 66 pounds. Performance is mediocre when running the Galleon in Class AB with the stock PS Vein KT88 tubes but switching it to Class A and Sound Profile B, which is the low feedback setting, that's a different story. You get that three-dimensional soundstage that the best tube amplifiers are prized for. There's also excellent levels of detail. Ideally, I'd like a little bit more bass weight and the treble has an inkling towards the bright side, but that can be fixed with partnering equipment and a bit of tube rolling. It's still a lovely sounding amplifier. I saw out February by reviewing the Alta Audio Lesser speakers the New York based manufacturer retails their entry level speakers for just a whisker under £5,000 in the UK, and I believe it's the same in dollars in the USA. It's taken a long time to find a pair of speakers that outperform my Parrot Response 1 SCs in all areas. Not only four years of reviewing, but after 25 years of ownership, I finally come across something that knocks the legendary British speaker off its perch. But this story doesn't end here. You can't really test great speakers unless you have partner equipment that's up to the task. The new entry-level amplifier from Trilogy Audio didn't disappoint. The 5,995 pound 921 integrated amplifier offered stunning levels of information retrieval and neutrality, but it just fell behind my exposure pre-monoblocks when it came to scale and dynamics. Right, so now it's the turn of the Kerr Acoustic K300 Mark III speakers that retail a little north of £6,000, but for that money you get fancy cabinet materials, great quality drivers and crossover components, and they're a transmission line design. I don't know about you, but that ticks an awful lot of boxes for me. So, have I saved the best till last? The K300 Mark III's are the baby in the range of Kerr acoustic speakers, retailing for £6,395 in satin real wood finishes, but gloss finishes and custom colours will stretch the price to £7,245. The K300s are fairly narrow but deep and reasonably high, making them one of the larger stand mount speakers that I've reviewed, measuring 420 by 195 by 395mm and weighing 12 kilograms. Imperial figures are 16.5 by 7.7 by 15.5 inches and 26.4 pounds. The transmission line port is covered by a cloth grill. The two-way design incorporates a 165 mm 6.5 inch ScanSpeak Revelator midwoofer made from a wood pulp. The tweeter is a Fountech 60 mm 2.4 inch pure ribbon that will play down to 1950 hertz ensuring that it's not crossing over in that critical 2 to 4 kilohertz range where our hearing is most sensitive. The rear metal plate houses the logo, model number and just one set of five-way speaker binding posts that are of decent quality.
As one of my viewers recently pointed out, there's a bit of a theme developing on this channel. I tend to like transmission line speakers. Now, I try to keep an open mind as far as possible, but we all have triggers, things in the design that we look for. And I have to admit, when I hear the words transmission line, my ears prick up. So what is a transmission line speaker and why do I tend to like them so much? Well, I discussed that in quite a bit of detail in my PMC Prodigy 5 review, which I'll link in the description. So if you want to know about the advantages and disadvantages of different speaker enclosure types, check that review out. But it's all to do with what happens with the back energy that's created from the woofer cone moving. The simplest type of enclosure is a sealed box where the energy is trapped inside the enclosure and can be used as a spring to improve the transient response of the driver. But they're inefficient, typically have less space, and the back wave generated from the woofer cone moving can reflect back and cause interference with the driver. That's why most speakers you'll encounter tend to be a base reflex design. The back energy from the woofer is fed through a port tuned to just below the resonant frequency of the driver. This extends the base response and improves efficiency, but there are problems integrating the phase response of the port with the mid woofer, and that's why most ported designs tend to be tubbier or more smeared in the base response compared to good seal box designs. A transmission line speaker takes the back energy of the woofer and feeds it down a tunnel. It's normally folded for practical considerations. The lining and the length of the line are both critical to ensure only the lowest frequencies are emitted and that the output is in phase with the woofer. There's greater complexity of design and build with a transmission line speaker, but if done correctly, not only do you get deep clean bass, but potentially also clean mids due to the back wave not reflecting back to the driver. Before I move on, I just want to talk about what you get for your money with these K300 speakers. The cabinet is constructed from Baltic birch plywood, which has superior acoustic properties to the much cheaper MDF. Just think, if you were buying a fine musical instrument, it wouldn't be made out of MDF. The midwoofer is the famous ScanSpeak Revelator, but there are many forms of this driver, and here the wood pulp version has been chosen. According to Jez Kerr, it has more low-end grunt and better peak power handling than the standard paper cone variant. The pure ribbon tweeter is even faster than an AMT and certainly conventional dome drivers. This is discussed in detail in my recent Alta Audio Alessa review, which also uses a Fountec tweeter. The crossover is second order, close to a Linkwitz Riley slope, with just six components in total. Bespoke custom wound air core inductors, high grade polypropylene capacitors from Clarity Cap and Janssen, and Kiwami carbon film resistors have been carefully selected by ear. A combination of cabinet design, materials, drivers and crossover parts is not what you're going to find in a three or four thousand pound speaker. So this design shows a lot of promise. Time to fess up. I knew a couple of weeks ago when I reviewed the outer audio Alessa speakers that it was down to them and these Kerr Acoustic K300 Mark III speakers for being the best two speakers that I've reviewed on this channel. It was just a question of which one was going to land in first spot and which one second. And that's why I held off the review for a couple of weeks so I could do some extensive AB listening to determine exactly that. Just in case you missed it, the Outer Audio Alessas retail for just under £5,000 and are the first speakers to surpass my Product Response 1 SEs in all departments better resolution, dynamics, and less sonic coloration. Well, it may have taken four years, but they seem to have come like London buses. You can now add two speakers to that list. The bass on the K300s hits harder and cleaner with naturally much more extension than my vintage Proax. It doesn't have quite the same note to note definition as the Alessas, but there's just a little bit more authority. I guess a way of describing it is that the Alyssas are large stand mounts with stunning levels of bass clarity, whereas the K300s have the low-end thrills and spills that I'd associate with the finest compact floor standards. They're not far behind when it comes to clarity, and they do compensate for that to some extent with some added bass weight, that extra little bit of bloom, not only in the bass, 
also bleeds through to the lower mid-range and that means that things like male vocals have a little bit more gravitas but you can't hear quite as deep into recordings as you can with the Alessas which unearth a little bit more micro textures and tones. As for high frequencies, there's almost nothing in it, not entirely surprising as both speakers pretty much use the same tweeter. It's superbly revealing and seamlessly integrated with the midwoofer. The Kerr speakers have a touch more presence. I'm talking about that critical area between two and 4,000 Hertz that gives vocals and lead instruments a little bit more prominence, but these K300s are a million miles away from sounding forward or bright. Because the tweeter is so capable and well integrated, the K300s also time extremely well. The soundstage has excellent depth and width, but they aren't quite as open or precise in imaging as the Alessas due to that touch of opaqueness in lower registers. Again, these are relatively small differences at the end of the day, choosing between the British Kerr acoustic speakers and the American outer audios, I think is gonna come down to availability and partnering equipment. That's a nice segue into the next section. Firstly, running on these K300s took quite a while. I'd get a couple of hundred hours on them before I start judging results. Also, they produce quite a bit of bass, so I had to wrestle with positioning with them more than I do with almost any stand mount speaker that I've encountered in my room, including the Alta Audio Alessas. I suppose that's down to the transmission line design, so I'd look upon them from a bass perspective, more like compact floor standards rather than large stand mounts. As for partner equipment, they'll pair very well with neutral sounding amplifiers or those that have a slight leaning towards the cool side. Not that my vintage 21 Exposure Pre and 18 Super Monoblocks fared badly, far from it. They offered the biggest soundstage and most impressive dynamics of any amplifier in my arsenal. Tonally, I felt the warmth of the exposures married to the warmth of the Kerr acoustic speakers was too much of a good thing. Also, the bass control of the exposures wasn't quite there to get the best out of the K300s. This reviewer's most reliable tool is the Hegel H190, and once again, it didn't let me down. With a 4000 damping factor, the 3250 pound Hegel kept the bass in check. Ultimately, it's the resolution and neutrality of the H190, which so often makes it my recommendation as a starting point for these more expensive speakers. And the Kerr K300s are no exception. If I had to push the boat out to buy these speakers, I could easily live with the H190 till I could afford to get something better. Spend more, and there is the promise to unearth more performance. That's exactly what the 5,995 pound Trilogy Audio 921 integrated amplifier delivers, upping clarity, focus, and stereo imaging considerably. Last week I said that the K300s were my favorite combination with the Trilogy amplifier. Well, there's a danger I was going off half cocked. I make no secret on this channel that I like a little bit of added harmonic richness. Warmth is what I normally describe it as. And that's what the Kerr speakers offer over the outer audio alessas, combined with the neutral sounding Trilogy 921. It's the tonality that I generally look for. And it tends to flatter a lot of the jazz, blues, vocal and acoustic centric music that I personally listen to. Of course, when I'm reviewing, I have to widen that remit. But I need to correct a previous assertion. I said that I preferred the K300 with the Trilogy amplifier. There were plenty of tracks where I preferred the extra detail that the Alyssas offered as well. It was handy that Thomas's Galleon TS120 SE amplifier was still here, as I wanted to know how a decent tube amplifier with low wattage and damping factor fared with the K300s. I ran it in Class A and the low feedback setting to get the best resolution. It sounded magnificent with simple recordings, layered, detailed and rich, but when things got motoring, the lack of control over the midwoofer was all too apparent. My advice with the K300s is in order to keep that transmission line bass in check, stick with good quality solid state amplification that has a stiff power supply and a fair amount of power. The Kerr Acoustic K300 Mark III speakers are a perfect example of you get what you pay for. The combination of cabinet materials, quality drivers and crossover components in the hands of a designer that clearly understands what he's doing 
delivers a performance that comfortably surpasses any speakers I've heard in the sub £3,000 category. Yeah, well, they should do given the price, but there's only one set of speakers above £3,000 that I've encountered that betters them in terms of all-round performance, and those are the outer audio lessers. But the Kerr speakers run them close, and that makes them pretty special in my book. The K300s are superbly dynamic resolving speakers that add just a little bit of warmth, and I know that's exactly what a lot of audiophiles are looking for, and that's why the Kerr Acoustic K300 Mark III speakers get a very, very highly recommended from this channel. Thank you to all of you who watched this roundup of products that I reviewed in my five to ten thousand pound category. I know it's more than a lot of you can or would choose to spend, but you watched anyway, and I am appreciative. I've had my indulgence and now it's time for yours. So my question of the day is what would you like to see me review over the next few months? Please let me know about that in the comment section. All that remains for me to say is if you like this video, if you like what I'm doing with this channel, you want to see it grow and assuming you haven't done so already, please like, share, subscribe, hit the bell notification. Check me out on Patreon. There's a couple of consultancy tiers you can access there if you think I can help you on your audiophile journey. Also check out the ABA Club on Patreon, which has some great ways to interact with me and fellow Patreons. But for today, for now, a British audiophile, signing off.